Justin, thanks so much for taking the time today. No problem. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Terrific. Well, listen, I think a great place to start would be giving listeners a little bit more info about your background and your journey to your current role at Anglia Ruskin University in the UK. Okay. Um, so I did my first degree in, uh, in the area of sports science, and um, that led me into kind of personal training and strength conditioning. Um, and it was around that time that I got heavily interested in nutrition, um, particularly sort of seeing people do things that, uh, you know, you, you normally wouldn't expect people to achieve certain goals doing certain diets. So that got me really interested in, in the nutrition side of things. So um, I studied uh, a master's degree, which involved uh, more clinical nutrition, looking at um, omega, omega-3 fish fatty acids and, and exercise training with metabolic syndrome. Mm-hmm. Um, and that led me on to do a PhD, which is more to do with like, metabolism and recovery. Um, and it's around the same sort of time of that. I also studied nutritional therapy. Um, so I'm a registered nutritional therapist as well as a, an accredited sport uh, and an exercise scientist. Wow, phenomenal. And the perfect segue into, you know, we were talking beforehand around your background in endurance sport as well. And you know, looking forward to talking about the uh, recent position stand you put out with the International Society of Sports Nutrition around nutritional considerations for ultra marathon training and racing. Can you tell listeners a little bit about how this project came about? Yeah, well, um, it was really my colleague, uh, Dr. Nick Tiller, who um, approached me, he he he's what i would call the real ultra person he's, he's nice. much more uh, advanced than me in terms of ultras we've both competed in a, a variety of events from ironman triathlons through to you know multi-day um endurance races such as the marathon de sable um mm-hmm. and um i'm i would i would call myself more of the kind of recreational ultra and i would call him more of the hardcore um super fast ultra nice <laughs> nice um but it was Nick that approached me with, um, he had this idea about effectively writing a, a literature review because both of us were uh, being approached by a number of uh, runners for advice about um, nutrition mm-hmm. and specifically how to, to fuel during training and racing. And there were two very distinct uh, questions we were getting. But uh, Nick had already done quite a lot of work already kind of compiling literature and, and writing material. But um had asked for my input from a nutrition perspective but also where we could take this and i um had already published a number of studies in uh, the international uh, journal for the society of sports nutrition and i kind of suggested maybe we should approach them with a, re- a view of doing a position stand um which of course they agreed and they liked the idea and actually when i spoke to the uh, chief editor it was um it was on their their hit list of, of, of position stands to write. And Terrific. one of the things he said to me was the reason it hadn't been written today is because it's such a big task, uh, it's such an onerous um, area with so many things that you could potentially cover. So um, we set about starting to collate information further and starting to compile a, 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 a semi position stand, if you like, and we realised we had so much information that we didn't know quite what to do with it. So we ended up bringing it right down to the basics: what what should runners do during training? What does the literature suggest? What's our opinion as well? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then also for racing as well, because um, they're obviously two very distinct areas. But also. Um, we decided quite late on in the whole procedure to narrow it down further to single stage ultramarathons because there was just too much information out there to give clear advice um, to all different types of ultra racing. So we focused on running and we focused on single stage events. True, I guess that's obviously really crucial to point out, isn't it, for listeners who are maybe more familiar with team sport nutrition or physique nutrition, you know, ultra events can can range in terms of obviously distances and 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 days that are involved um and so if we start off the conversation here around just daily requirements like they're influenced by so many different factors for even a recreational versus you know elite uh, runner could you walk the listeners through some of the factors that would play into the daily caloric requirements Oh wow, there's so many. Um, well, as we kind of highlighted in the paper, it's um, it's quite difficult because 
instead of just saying there's a you know athlete should be eating this amount of uh, of energy uh, or food we obviously stated that there were many factors that would influence a, a person's daily calorific intake and I'm, I'm referring specifically around training here as opposed to you know, calorie requirements for racing mm-hmm. uh, um, but specifically you know when you look at things like the basal metabolic rate of, of an individual um how much non-exercise activity they might be doing in the background which will be highly variable between people yeah, sedentary um, job versus somebody who's moving around all day right absolutely i mean that could range by several hundred calories easily um and that might change someone's requirements uh, which might not appear to be um dramatic but over time could all uh, add up um and obviously one of the big concerns in the current uh, literature is this this concept of relative energy deficiency in in sport so red as, as a short mm-hmm. um so one of the big issues i see with a lot of athletes is this kind of classic uh, either eating the same foods all the time or not eating enough of what they might require uh, in terms of calorie um, intake so Basal metabolic rates, uh, daily activity, what type of foods you're eating, um, what you're, how you're training. So just the, the training requirements, specifically in terms of um, how much training you're doing, volume of training and intensity of training. These will all have an impact on your daily calorific needs. Yeah, it is fascinating. You mentioned sort of the fueling and under fueling and, of course, We'll definitely get into the conversation around carbohydrates and fats, which is a really polarized one when it comes to um, mm. life in general, and of course with with ultra running. But maybe let's first jump in around protein intake. You know, protein requirements for ultra endurance athletes. You know, I think for the typical, you know, the general ultra runner, these recommendations are likely higher than they're they're probably used to, or that they would mm. assume. So, can you outline the recommended protein intake and? And give us some some background as to why it's so important for ultra runners. Well, I think the first thing to just um, note um, is that when we talk about ultra running, we're talking about distances that are typically longer than a marathon. So, for most single stage ultras, you're talking um, you know, anywhere from six hours onwards would would kind of get into the zone of of ultra uh, distance. Um, and of course, if you start talking about um, single stage at the higher end, you could be talking 24 hours. Um, if you're talking multi days, you could be talking 40, 48 hours plus. So bonkers. the type of training that goes into that will be considered quite high volume and quite long distance compared to maybe half marathon or marathon distance training. Um, and as a result, the demands on the body are, are going to be more sustained. Um, so when we looked at the literature, I mean, the, the, the problem with a lot of the material we read is that often contemporary research gives very broad guidelines, you know, sort of 1.2 to 2.1 mm-hmm. grams of protein per kilogram body mass per day. Um, and so when we tried to look a bit further, it seemed that nitrogen balance or rather this ability to maintain a degree of uh, um, uh, positive balance seems to lie somewhere around the 1.6 grams per kilo per day. Now, if you then add in other factors, not just muscle synthesis, but other factors associated with protein demands and also calorific requirements, the um, approximate estimate would be somewhere between 1.6 and even as high as 2.5 grams per kilo per day. So I think protein's um, not ne- not necessarily underestimated, but I think it's very important. Yeah, it can almost be it. Not quite overlooked, but yeah, underestimated in the sense of the even some of the you know coaches out there who coach running, you know, typically wouldn't think to get up to a gram per pound, even more so during specific training blocks. And mm-hmm. as you guys point out in the paper, this is can be pretty crucial for you know recovery, immunity, all these various factors that can take a beating with all that training volume. And you know, mm-hmm. you talk about long bouts of training as well being protein consumption be particularly important after the long bouts of training. Can you? Circle back to that a little bit. In terms of recovery? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, the, the sort of literature points towards um, the idea that it's it's more to do with the total amount of protein that's being consumed. But if we isolate the recovery period specifically, the suggestion is that um, taking small boluses or dosages of, um, of protein after training may improve the 
the impact on recovery, particularly if you're building in resistance training alongside endurance training. So, you know, some of the literature talked about 20 to 30 grams of protein um, within a short time frame after training, such as within an hour. Um, But it seems to me that um, an intermediate protein strategy, so 20 grams every three hours, might be more uh, effective in the longer term. Yeah, it is um, interesting when we look at just the stress levels, the mechanical stress associated with the, you know, the distances that are being covered, and of course, you know, making a protein that much more important. Um, the metabolic overload as well. I mean, the, it's uh, really something that nutritional practitioners as well as athletes need to be cognizant of because it's going to be fueling potentially a lot more frequently than they might be used to. Mm. And interesting enough, I mean, just from my own personal experience of working with uh, ultra runners um, and, and endurance athletes, I should add, it seems to me that many athletes are quite aware of this and they actually seem to eat a reasonable amount of protein, as in, you know, the 1.4 to 1.6 category mm-hmm. or range. But I suppose with an ultra athlete, it's the awareness that maybe their needs could be higher. And it's it's this could the word could that is kind of interesting here because everyone's different and everyone will have their own individual requirements. So one individual might only need 1.3, 1.4 grams per kilo, but another individual might need 1.9, 2.1 grams per kilo. And this is what makes it a whole whole area quite difficult. Yeah. It's definitely the art of the practice and, Mm. you know, taking into consideration, you know, that subjective wellness and immunity and how they're adapting to training and all those factors obviously going into figuring out what the right uh, dose is and if we transition now to carbohydrate needs i mean these are tremendous distances that need to be covered although at a slower pace so you know what are the carbohydrate needs for ultra runners what are the suggestions there well again you know if we're we're talking about training only at this stage um there's a real (laughs) there's a real um parallel in the literature between whether athletes should eat a low carbohydrate diet or whether they should eat a high carbohydrate diet and i'm forever being asked this question Uh, it seems that every talk i do i'm always asked should athletes eat a high fat diet or a high carb diet um i think the important thing to remember is that with ultra distance uh, training there's a heavy reliance on glycogen on stored glycogen and as a result the literature pretty much convincingly and overwhelmingly supports the idea of uh, a high carbohydrate diet. So to give that some context, around 60% of energy intake would be considered moderately to high mm-hmm. uh, levels. So in, in training, that might require something like 5 to 8 grams of carbohydrate per kilo body mass, which if anyone's ever tried that, trying to get up to 8, 9 yeah, uh, grams. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's hard work, right? Quite, tra- quite challenging um and of course if you've got people with even higher mileage um those values might even be higher so seven to ten grams per kilo is often quoted yeah i mean it's obviously you know re- muscle repair but central nervous system as well and as you mentioned it's difficult to get up to those seven mm. eight nine ten grams per kilo and that's where obviously liquid nutrition can be really impactful to be able to try to achieve some of those numbers and you know in the paper you also talk about some train low strategies. Could you outline how that potentially could be, you know, an effective training strategy to help us, you know, promote some of these adaptations? uh, Absolutely. This was actually, um, I'm sure Nick will listen to this at some stage, but um, this was actually (laughs) a hot topic when we were writing the paper because um, there were lots of debates between us about whether athletes should actually try to consume a low carbohydrate diet. And the, the general premise goes something like this, that, um, the research suggests that if you're training in a, a, a low glycogen state or a semi-depleted state, that you will end up getting certain specific adaptations that might be favorable in the longer term, such as um, enhanced uh, fat metabolism during exercise. So in the paper, we kind of suggested there were two, there might be two practical ways of doing this. One could be, you know, training in a fasted state in the morning when your liver glycogen might well be up to about 80% depleted already. So you're, make, you're placing more demand on, on fat stores to, to, to support the training. Mm-hmm. And the other one could be training twice a day where, where you're kind of depleting muscle glycogen and then further training in, on, on that or, or fueling around one session only, like a later session in the day. And there's some research that suggests that um, 
or rather supports the idea that uh, uh, oxidative pathways and fat metabolism pathways can be accelerated and also that there might be upregulations in certain uh, protein signaling pathways that might favor um, endurance athletes. Um, the real challenge with all of this is we, we need to see more research being done specific to ultra marathon running. Um, because it's a fine so line, have, isn't it, when you get into sort of a chronic training with lowered intakes, isn't it? Exactly. And then we, we, we also hinted at that and suggested that at the beginning of a, a training period or season, uh, when you're trying to get these acute adaptations, but then also chronic adaptations, there may be an advantage to training periodically in low low glycogen or low carbohydrate states but then the evidence the current evidence suggests that if you're looking at performance specifically higher intensity performance that training with um, either depleted um, muscle glycogen and or a ketogenic style diet might not be favorable for those that are trying to in, actually obtain a high level of performance it's interesting as well when we think about just the number of competitions that some of these athletes will perform over the course of a year. And so, you know, when you're doing a hundred mile or every every quarter or so, that could definitely add up towards the end of a year, can it? It can. And again, we, we, when we we actually interviewed um, quite a few ultra runners for this paper, and we 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 did this through a, a research study that was um, uh, was given ethical approval. And um, in interviewing all of these different types of athletes that range from I would say novice ultra runners through to world champion or world class level um, ultra runners. Not one of them. There was not no consistency. It was very different across the the types of athletes. And one thing that was very clear is it, very few of them restrict carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's interesting to see just how it's difficult in the general public to kind of dissociate between. You know, diets like a low carb or ketogenic diet might be effective for somebody with struggling with a metabolic condition or type 2 diabetes, you know, typically because inherently it's going to reduce ultra processed foods, right? Carbohydrates go down, caloric intake goes down sometimes significantly. But on the flip side, if you're an active individual or an athlete, all of a sudden that huge caloric deficit uh, and lack of carbohydrates is, is becomes a real problem, right? Absolutely. <clears throat> and, and as we said, we kind of there may be some advantage at the early part of a training period, but um, we have to remember that many of these athletes will be training at least every other day, if not every day, and in some cases twice a day. So just to manage that over time, the, the carbohydrate requirements are likely going to be a lot higher than expected. And that's when we can also get into things around injury risk as well, right? If carbohydrate intake is not up to speed or if we're relying solely on fats, then we can potentially have some you know, deficiencies that might uh, crop up in terms of, you know, various nutrients. Uh, so definitely Absolutely. things for practitioners to think about when it comes to, to those approaches. Um, so we've talked, you know, training nutrition. How does the story change when we talk about race day nutrition? And, and maybe a good place to start is actually just the enormous energy expenditure that's happening uh, during these races. Can you uh, fill people in on exactly, you know, what somebody might be expending during a typical 50 mile race? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, one one thing to just add to that before we get into the actual race itself yeah. is, uh, you know, when people talk about race, they talk about race day, and I think you know, I'm I'm still doing some races, but certainly nowhere near the level of uh, Doctor Tiller. But um, I, when you look at racing itself, you have to think about the period leading up to it as well, because mm -hmm. that needs to be taken into consideration in the context of the race strategy. Um, what makes a single day quite challenging is it depends on the type of race you're doing. <clears throat> so, for example, you know, you could be doing, um, I don't know, let's just say you're doing a 100-mile race <clears throat> where the pace is quite slow, as in maybe six to, to eight kilometers an hour on average. Yeah. You know, a, a lightweight athlete might expend something like 7,000 calories, that sort of territory, whereas a slightly heavier, like 70-kilo athlete, might expend closer to 10,000 calories um, wow. just in the context of just the running. And so when you break that down, that would, that works out something like about 350 to 400 calories an hour for a, a heavier or slightly heavier individual. And when you think of it, that, that, that context, trying to keep getting that in is it's hard almost work. impossible. Yeah. It's, it's almost impossible. So, and in fact, I, I haven't actually seen any research in the field that reports athletes matching their calorific demands 
if anything it's quite the opposite well yeah absolutely and it, i mean it is you know in the paper you guys talk about you know a 50 kilogram athlete on a 50 miler at a pace of about eight kilometers an hour expending yeah about 3500 calories and as you mentioned you know 70 kilogram athlete f- almost 5000 calories i mean that's uh, some significant expenditure and you know mm-hmm. when the it's an interesting race because obviously the 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 pace is so slow that even the training the training runs are at a faster pace than even the competition um mm-hmm. pace which is obviously the flip side of, of typically if you're running a half marathon or a marathon um and so when we look at you know reasons why athletes get tired you know even before uh before fueling you know it, what are some of the obviously we have, we can run out of substrate but this idea of a central fatigue hypothesis what's going on here okay well um one, one thing just to uh, backtrack to the the calories um <clears throat> you know we, we're talking about distance only here and we have to also factor in other considerations such as terrain environmental terrain most ultra runs are not on flat surfaces that are nicely paved or nicely grassed there are you know, very undulating very different terrain the, the the environment itself the weather can also have, have a, a big role to play in in metabolic demands as well um if we if we look if we look at say um central fatigue there's there's a there's a relationship between um time and and also the point where someone starts to fatigue so you know if you're doing prolonged exercise in excess of four five six hours which ultra running would come into quite easily that will increase the metabolism of um a chemical called 5-hydroxytryptamine or 5-ht for short or serotonin in the brain which is as as that starts to be produced we see common symptoms around uh, lethargy uh, tiredness maybe drowsiness maybe even reduced motivation so um as a result there's a, a connection between tryptophan and branch chain amino acids so the idea is that um uh, there's a competition here so um if we if we start to deplete our levels of uh, branch chain amino acids this might lead to increased levels of of um tryptophan so the idea is that can branch chain amino acids have a role to play in reducing or maybe delaying uh, that level of fatigue in some individuals? Um, and that's where the general concept of BCAs from this perspective comes in. And how does the research look there in terms of potential ability to be able to, to offset that? I mean, it seems like <clears throat> obviously in those types of, you know, the duration of these events, um, combating fatigue has got to be pretty high up on the list in terms of uh, priorities so uh, you know is there a a potential role there for bca supplementation with the mechanism being uh, in in our opinion there is definitely a role to play and it's it's definitely feasible that um branch state amino acids may well uh, offset um, fatigue in in some individuals the problem is we need more um specific research to ultra marathons and the, the research we looked at was to, uh, involving more cyclists over several hours, so it mm-hmm. might, apply, but it's not necessarily very specific to ultra marathon running. Um, and in those studies, taking BCEs, particularly when these athletes were exercising in, in hotter conditions, um, had a role to play in, in prolonging time to exhaustion. So, in the case of bringing that or, or, or translating that to ultra marathon, is difficult. But if there is an overlap it suggests that some individuals might benefit if um, the event is quite prolonged. Interesting. And if we if we actually circle back to that race day nutrition and talk about, again, you know, carbohydrate needs whilst one's running, you know, is there a range there that the research is telling us that for an ultra event, athletes should be aiming for? Well, we looked at um, a number of studies on this that where, where um, I should also mention that within the paper, we didn't exclude... Uh, any type of study and we made it very clear where the evidence category was coming from um, and re- the reason for that is because most of the literature on ultra marathon specific running has been conducted at events which is kind of understandable uh, it's hard to set these things up in a laboratory condition um, so we were looking at some um, events or looking at papers where they had worked with athletes in the field and as a result, um, we're, we're taking information from that perspective, what, what ultra marathoners have actually done in different races. And um, 
with regards to the carbohydrate, there was uh, there's a clear pattern forming in the literature, which in which if you look at finishers versus non-finishers, um, it seems to me that those that finish races are able to maintain a more consistent pattern of feeding. And so, for example, um, and again, I should also add that within that, the, the literature suggests there's a big range between athletes. So it's not as if they're all eating the same sort of amounts. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the ranges could be quite different. So, for example, um, you know, uh, a, a slower runner might average maybe 20 to 30 grams an hour of carbohydrate, whereas a, a, a finisher or a faster finisher might actually be able to tolerate higher amounts of carbohydrate, such as around 40 to 60 grams an hour. Um, so there's this kind of range that uh, is suggested in, in the literature. Yeah, that's sometimes the case where, unfortunately, it can be translated poorly from coach to, to athlete. And if we have some of those novice runners fueling at a higher rates than they should be fueling at, you know, more towards the 60 rather than the 20, then this is definitely a situation where at some point we could get some rebound hypoglycemia or, or bonking at certain stage, correct? I think I think there's another problem there as well, which is because the ranges are so broad, there's, there's one message that, I don't know if we said it in the paper, but it seems to me that there's a, there's a case for trial and error here in training um, to try and understand where your limit is. Um, you know, the contemporary uh, sports drinks research suggests that values as high as 90 grams an hour from mixed carbohydrate sources might be the more higher level of tolerance. But, you know, having done these events ourselves, I don't know that many um, ultra runners that would just stick to a, a pure sports drink strategy and, and probably wouldn't tolerate it for longer than a few hours anyhow. And in fact, pretty much all of them ate solid food at some level during their races. Um, now, because of that very high range, it means that some people are are likely or more likely going to experience from some sort of GI distress during the event. And so, to me, that's, that that spells that that sort of screams a little bit of this needs to be practiced and trialed and tested in training to understand where the individual uh, tolerance level lies. Um, and this concept of gut training has also come out in the literature as well. Yeah, it's it's obviously critical for athletes to be able to, even recreational athletes, to be able to find that sweet spot where they can tolerate certain amounts. Um, I'm sure everyone's experienced going out in a run and having, you know, slow gastric emptying and, and the discomfort that one gets I mean, from I mean, that. One, yeah, absolutely. And one thing we did pick up on is that it seems to it seems to us anyhow that um, if the calorific intake is kept quite low, particularly for very long, as in hundred mile events. Um, So if if you're consistently eating under about 200 calories an hour, uh, this suggests that um, you're more likely going to have problems later on. Um, So trying to maintain that higher uh, calorific and to an extent carbohydrate intake consistently over time is part of the key uh, to to success in in ultramarathon running. And Justin, was there any specific snack items or food items that were common or more popular amongst the runners that you interviewed <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm, really. I'm sure i'm sure everyone's just wanting to know you know what were they what were they consuming well we 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 kind of um <clears throat> we kind of stumbled onto a kind of um i wouldn't call it pandora's box but um when we interviewed uh the these a uh, number of uh ultra runners it it just seemed to me that everyone's got their own opinion and their own strategy, which is fine. Uh, we have to work with the individual as individuals, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, some people will mix and match their foods with with um, more liquid based foods such as gels and to, and, and occasionally sports drinks. Um, some people were eating things like um, homemade energy bars or, or granola bars. Other people were snacking on um, dried fruits such as. Um, like banana chips, for example, or even watermelon was quoted. Um, and then other people were trying to focus on getting that balance between carbohydrate and protein stroke fat through things like um, beef jerky or um, chorizo or salami sticks or something like that. And on the fat side of things, obviously at this pace, you know, that would be something that athletes might turn to more, obviously more frequently than in a half marathon or a marathon as they you know, when we talk about, and maybe this comes into the supplementation category, but even around foods of, you know, whether it's nut butters or 
you know, <coughs> ketone supplements, MCT oil, some of these things that are more popular now with the ultra crowd? Yeah, again, we, we when we look at the sort of food choices that um, our, our, our um, survey group were, were, were consuming, um, many of them weren't actually taking MCTs as MCTs. They were taking MCT energy bars, so bars that had been enhanced with medium chain triglycerides. Yeah. Um, but most of them seem to get their fat sources from meat-based products or um, nuts, nuts, nut-based products such as cashews, for example, came up quite a lot, and um, nut butters came up quite a lot. Um, but it seemed to me that when we, when we were speaking to, to them, and I, I don't know how clear this is in the literature, but it seems that many of them start off on a, a carbohydrate, almost sweet-like approach, and then swap to almost like a salt savory approach, which we, we found quite interesting, and it certainly matched our experiences as well. Interesting, yeah. It's that palatability factor, and um, you know, for yourself, when you were when you made that switch, was you know, what what were some of the kind of inherent symptoms or reasons that you felt that you made the switch over? Um, I think part of it was um, I won't call it taste fatigue, but um, I'm going to use that term. Um, yeah, <laughs> it was it's like too much sweet. Yeah, and certainly, I th- I found this in in Ironmans, for example, where. It's just got to the point where I, I haven't felt like drinking or eating any more sugar, uh, specifically from gels or, or sports drinks. And there's been a desire to eat something a little more salty or savory. And that could also overlap the point where you start to feel a little bit more dehydrated than you're aware of. And at that point there, I think the whole area of hydration and, and um, electrolyte concentration probably takes over a little bit. A great point. And, you know, on the hydration front, obviously, you know, six, eight, 10 plus hours running, you know, when we look at the hydration needs, obviously there's significant sweat losses from running these kind of distances. You know, what are some of the typical losses that you might see from an ultra marathon runner in a competition? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I, I'd have to go back and look at the literature on that one, but, um, Certainly, when we've we've done trials in under control conditions in under laboratory conditions with uh, Ironman triathletes, for example, uh, we've seen values ranging from in male male subjects ranging from 0.7 kilos an hour through to 1.9 uh, kilos an hour of sweat of pure pure water loss. Wow. Uh, so it's highly variable. Um, in in females, it's been lower than this. It's been about 0.3 of a kilo. So that's roughly about 300 milliliters of of, of, of sweat or water loss um, through to about 0.8 of a kilo. So it's highly variable. The thing is, though, um, that may not necessarily be consistent over the whole um, duration of the race. Gotcha. So, but um, one of the things that was quite clear in, in when we looked at how to hydrate for these races is it's all well and good looking at how much water or sweat someone's losing in an hour but to try and consistently get that back on board is incredibly tough if not impossible so looking at gastric emptying rates you'd probably be better off recommending lower amounts but more frequently so i think in the paper we quoted something like 400 to 700 milliliters an hour Mm -hmm. yeah i mean sort of small and often is a good uh heuristic for a lot of folks and ultra runners in particular and of course on the salt and electrolyte side of things is that um, you know sodium obviously playing a, a key role if, if runners are losing you know are sweating a lot and of course oftentimes these races are in hot environments as well right yeah absolutely and um <clears throat> we we um we kind of came to the, again the whole concept of do people need to take uh, sodium tablets or um, electrolytes um, is is not controversial, but it is you know contended in the in the literature. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we, when we've gone through races ourselves and and taken on board electrolytes versus not taking on electrolytes, we've noticed big differences in ourselves. Um, when we then look at uh, what the literature suggests um, in terms of um, recovery from from exercise, but also maintaining that uh, or minimizing that electrolyte loss. Um, two things that came out. One was that um, the amounts in most commercial products are often uh, potentially lower than what you might lose in, say, sweat. So being aware of or being mindful of how much sodium you might need to get on board, um, if you're not doing it through food intake, you might need to consider uh, additional electrolyte supplements. Um, 
which we we we, we talk about in the, in the paper in more depth. Yeah, it's interesting in the paper. Obviously, you talk about how you know typically an ultra marathon training session is going to cause substantial dehydration. Yet only about an estimated twenty percent of endurance runners are actually monitoring their hydration status. And so, you know, as you mentioned, you know, adding salt to food or obviously during in, in water during during training and races is key. But that day to day hydration, obviously independent of training, being also really important just to keep those levels topped up. Correct. Yeah. And if we, you know, round this out by shifting gears to the supplement side of things, you know, when we look at these long events lasting multiple hours and where discomfort and uh, pain and, and pushing through is important. Obviously things like caffeine come to mind as potential strategies to help, you know, resu- reduce perceived exertion and things like that. Throughout the paper, you know, what were some of the supplements that came up as potential, um, potential strategies for, for athletes looking to perform? Well, obviously you, you, know, you, you mentioned caffeine there, which is probably the headline for us because, um, <clears throat> when you start looking at ultra distance and particularly towards the latter third of the, of the race where fatigue is, is, is going to be setting in um, <clears throat> the suggestion of caffeine having a, a stimulant effect, but more specifically used towards the end of the race uh, was highlighted in, in the, in the paper and at a lower dose potentially. So it's, it's not as if we should be focusing on high dose caffeine uh, uh, acutely, but more sort of lower dose, but, specifically if they're taking it over several hours but focusing on caffeine intake to stimulate the the, the individual uh, towards the end of the race um so that one we, we played on in, in the paper um the other the, the other supplements we kind of came across which were very interesting of other than mcts which um hasn't really been well supported in the literature was the use of ketone esters um now the big problem we've got with many of these supplements is that there's very little research specific to single stage ultra uh, events. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's be, there's been recent insights into um, ketone esters, which have been used alongside carbohydrate repletion strategies to enhance um, effectively fuel metabolism during exercise, which I think could be quite useful for the future. And I think it's where we need to see some more uh, specific research to sustain uh, running. Uh, that would be quite interesting to know. Um, and the other uh, areas we looked at were um, things like vitamins and minerals. It's interesting to note that um, a lot of athletes do use uh, supplements, acute supplements such as vitamin C, <clears throat> which may have an effect on um, the immune system and may have uh, preventative effects, if you like, on upper respiratory tract infections. Um but you know, when you actually look at whether these these supplements have any beneficial impact on on performance, the the evidence is is pretty much um, limited. Um, so it's difficult to sort of answer the question whether ultra endurance athletes need to be supplementing directly. Um, and then the other one was obviously things like sports drinks we talked about as well. Terrific, and you know, obviously mindset plays a huge role in these events that are, you know, maybe more mental than physical and. As someone, I believe you've done the Marathon des Sables, right, yourself? Mm-hmm. Well, yes. You know, can you share with listeners your experience and, and, and what that was like uh, five uh, days in the desert? Painful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually did it the same year as Nick. Um, so um, when we did the race, uh, Nick was literally in the tent opposite with me, uh, opposite to me. He was with the a more experienced um, elite group, and I was with uh, a group of runners who were uh, very, very good. But I was the the recreational one, I would say. Um, my experience um, physically, I was. I think both of us were in very good places uh, physically uh, and mentally. Uh, we both had prepared in in the heat. We had used heat acclimation as a strategy to to get us to. Uh, the race we had also trialed the foods we were going to use in in sahara ahead of the race so we were well prepared for what we were up against um what we weren't prepared for is just how bad the feet get <laughs> yeah um, my, my own experience personally and i'm, I'm sure nick would uh, support this was um it wasn't so much chafing of the feet as in rubbing it was more uh, blisters underneath the feet from the pressure of just continuous running yeah um that's what affected me the most. Um, in terms of the, the, the fueling, um, interesting enough, we just stuck to the strategy of a morning breakfast, which was a, an expedition style food, uh, an evening meal, which was an expedition style food. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
and these were just high calorie freeze dried um, meals, obviously because you have to carry everything you need in the desert. Um, throughout the day, we were kind of snacking on small things, like sesame snap uh, biscuits, for example, or the odd gel here and there, or maybe half a sports drink. It was, and maybe trail mixed foods. It was kind of spread out over the day. We were also taking salt tablets, which were kind of given to us by the the organizer, and we stuck to that because we. Um, we had read an awful lot around dehydration and, and hyponatremia. Um, we had zero problems when it came to hydration and um, fueling. Uh, the only point where I would say it got to me a little bit was on the, the double marathon stage, which is um, day four going into day five, mm -hmm. which then gets into the ultra single stage category. I found it quite hard to eat after about 10 hours. So I remember getting to one of the checkpoints and thinking, right, I need to sit down and actually eat something here. And I just didn't feel hungry. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. And I was almost telling myself I need to force feed a little bit or kind of a bit of tolerance here. Hijack the brain a little bit to get something in, right? A little bit. And th it was, it, this is quite interesting because after the race, I spoke to a number of colleagues who had done the race and they had almost similar um, experiences. Um those that didn't eat seemed to be the ones that struggled. Those that actually managed to get something in were able to. What we found was that they, by kind of, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word force feeding, but kind of just tolerating a little bit of food, within about half an hour, we were all able to maybe get a bit more in. And that's what allowed us to keep going through through the dark, the dark patch, if you like. Wow, yeah, that double marathon fourth day has definitely got to be something else. Um, <laughs> having not done it myself, only only trekked around the Sahara. Um, what was that like crossing the finish line on the fifth day? Then, when you when you put all those miles in and uh, and all the blisters, I got I got to be honest, it was um, it mixed emotions, but a bit of an anti climax because um, I remember when I'd finished. For me, Sahara finished on day. Five, the beginning of day five i came in quite early hours of the morning and because i had done the the, the double marathon in my head i'd already finished um sure. so i found the next two stages quite easy in in some respects because i'd mentally i was over the, the big one and i remember on the very last day <laughs> this is quite funny I, I remember sitting with my colleagues in my tent and uh, saying what do we absolutely need to take home with us um like sleeping bag so put your sleeping bag in your in your rucksack that's it. So we were literally just throwing everything <laughs> out of our bags on the last day. And therefore, I was I, I was actually running with next to nothing on my back. So the last day, I remember running quite well, quite quite hard for the whole distance. Um, and so at the very end of Sahara, and obviously, I'm sure the course changes every year, but at the very end, you come out of the desert. And as you come out of the desert and you approach this, this town, um, I can't remember the name of it. You go through a, a very poor area, a very um, uh, an area where a, a lot of people are just literally um, living in in very poor conditions. Mm -hmm. And I remember running through this, and that kind of emotionally affected me. Um, so you you go through all this where you're seeing you know local people living in very tough conditions, and then you finish in this town where everyone's celebrating. So yeah, mixed emotions is probably the answer. Yeah, I can, I can imagine, obviously, between the topography and the scenery and the physical output and the mindset and there's just the situations you mentioned, it must be uh, pretty pretty intense emotions on both sides. And yeah, Justin, if we, if we come back here, you know, I appreciate you carving out some time here today. When we look at the evolution of research in this area, you know, wh where do you think things should be going or what might be coming down the pipeline in the next five or ten years? Well, in terms specific to ultra running, yeah yeah i think um i mean personally what i would like to see is more funded research um people actually getting involved with with research around the world to look at um some of the things we we highlight in the paper um to to basically support what we've done i think this position stand is is a, a good starting point i think over the next five years we're going to see some new updates and some new changes which will probably challenge some of the things we've put in this paper um, I hope they do. I, I'd like to see it evolve. Um, I'd like to see more practical recommendations that are supported by controlled research as well as field-based research. Um, 
so I would, yeah, I think I think research is the key word. Um, I'd also like to see some more um, evidence of some of the supplements and whether they're actually benefiting runners or not. Um, I think there's some recent research that's just coming out now looking at the ketogenic diets and sustained performance, which I think will continue to be evolving as well as things like intermittent fasting um, approaches. So, yeah, I can see the, the whole area evolving over the next five years. And I think then we'll have some more concrete ideas of what people should be doing in these events. Fantastic. Justin, listen, I appreciate you carving out some time today. Terrific insights. Encourage everyone to to read the papers, especially if you're a, uh, obviously if you're a practitioner, but if you're an ultra runner, it's a mandatory reading to so you can perform your best in 2020. So, you know, Justin, where can people stay connected with you and keep up with all your terrific research? <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. Um, I'm I'm based at Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge in the UK. Um, you can contact me via the, on the paper. You've got uh, my my correspondence details. Um, yep. Which uh, and myself and Dr. Tiller are both freely contactable on the paper. So um, do feel free to get in touch if you'd like to ask me any questions. Phenomenal. Thanks so much, Justin.